Hi, we're here with Walpole's Chief of Police, Richard Kelleher, who was appointed to the position in December of 2021 after an extensive review process. I actually went to business school <laughs> um, prior to joining um, the police department. It was something I always wanted to do, but I also had an interest in, in going to college and, and, and taking the business route. So I started, I started there um, and then started taking police exams and got hired by the Medfield Police Department in 2005. Uh, I worked there as a patrol officer until November of 2007 at which time I transferred here. So I worked as a patrol officer here until 2011. At that point, I became uh, a detective. I worked in detectives until, um, I think it was August of 2016 is when I was promoted to patrol sergeant. I worked on, in that role for a little less than a year and uh, transitioned back to detectives to supervise the detective division. Um, in 2020, January 2020, I became the deputy chief of police here. Um, and I worked under Chief Carmichael until um, I took over as the interim chief in June and then became appointed permanently in the uh, end of December. So just about 17 years in total. So um, yeah, it was a quick, quick, uh, quick move, but it's been good. What is something that you've learned either about yourself or the position since becoming chief of police? So this, this job has been, there's been a lot to learn. Um, I think it's really no secret that I'm young for this role. Um, I, I'm, I'm halfway through my career. So stepping into this, I had a lot to learn. Um, I had a great person to learn from um, in Chief Carmichael who came before me um, and I tried to embrace a, a lot of the things that he was doing and, and learn on the fly. What I didn't anticipate, I, I, I <laughs> it's a difficult question to answer, but uh, there was a lot I didn't anticipate right out of the gate. But I've been fortunate to have a great support staff here that have helped work through some of the more complicated issues we've had to manage. Um, but I'd say the most challenging thing is trying to be a liaison between the community and also represent our department. You know, so I have to manage the needs and you know what the community like to see come out of our, our department. But also, I'm a member of this department and I work with these officers every day to make sure that they feel like they're supported and they're represented. And, and even though it's a challenge, it's been great here because we haven't you know we, we have a great relationship with our community. So it's been. It's been rewarding so far, even if it's been a short period of time, but um, that would be the biggest challenge and, and one thing that I've really tried to manage. Um, but again, it's, it's, been, it's been good on both sides. Can you speak about the department's recent effort to secure grant funding for a full-time mental health clinician? What does that process look like and why is there a need for such a position? So we have um, a tremendous amount of mental health related calls. Um, the it's been an ongoing, uh, we shifted from uh, having heavy response to uh, op the opioid crisis and that it's shifting now to primarily um, mental health related. Of course, we still have uh, opioid issues we're dealing with and, and drugs and things of that nature, substance use disorder, um, but mental health has been really the primary um, focus now. Um, we had over nearly 1,200 calls for service last year um, that were related to mental health. So. Uh, as part of that, um, we moved into looking into options to, to, to get a jail diversion clinic, a clinician uh, to work with us. Um, we've reached out to um, Advocates, which is a, a group that is uh, contracted by DMH to assist departments in securing grant funding. Um, right now, our, our uh, application has been submitted. Uh, we presented before the select board several weeks ago um, to get that process rolling and, and moving forward. It's, it's moving very rapidly now, actually. The application has been approved. The funding is um, nearly just secured, and uh, we're going to move into the hiring process very soon. So I feel that like this is going to be incredibly beneficial to our department um, it, to really facilitate in getting folks the help they deserve and the help they need. Um, our officers are very well trained in um, crisis intervention, um, but these people are licensed clinicians, and they can really help these folks get the help they need. And we can, you know, it'll take the burden off the officers, but it also, again, it'll be a, a service to, to, to the community that the community really needs right now. And, and, and that's statistics based, but it's also just our officers are, you know, every day it's, it's dead managing it. So I think that this will be incredibly helpful to the department. Can you speak about the department's newly established crime tip line, how it works and how it's expected to impact public safety? So the crime tip line uh, is managed by our detectives. Um, so if there's, Obviously, sometimes some folks don't want to, they may not want to have their um, identity known. So this is, this is a, a, a line that people can reach out to um, and, and report a crime or, or at least, 
you know, make our, us aware of something that might be going on in the event that they may not want to call 911 or, or speak to an officer right away for various reasons. Um, sometimes folks feel more secure or, or, or they may be more likely to report crimes if, if they know that they can do so um, anonymously or, you know, or, or, you know, things of that nature. So we feel this will be uh, a good way for us to, to be aware of, of, of these crimes and, and uh, facilitate and uh, solving them and, and uh, improving, you know, quality of life issues. What does the phrase officer safety and wellness encompass and how are those concerns prioritized within the department? So officer safety and wellness is incredibly important these days. I mean, we, we, you see officers um, that have been on for a long time and, and, and have the, the cumulative effects of, of responding to calls year after year suffer mental health issues as they get later in their careers and, and unfortunately can lead to to a lot of different various issues, you know, at home, but also suicide. And, and that's something that we we really take very seriously here. We have, um, we're part of a peer support group um, through Metrolec and we have officers that are um, in the process of being trained for that to be part of that group. These are officers that dedicate their time to go and meet with other officers after a critical incident. So we feel it's important to do that um, on a regular basis because like I said before, it's the cumulative effects of these things that, that catch up to you as your career goes on. It might not be the one call, but when you go to several calls that, that you know, a similar and, and, and may have not have gone well, depending on what it is, um, that affects officers. And us as police officers, and I know a lot of first responders would feel kind of the same way that we don't want to reach out to ask for help um, for various reasons, stigma and, you know, things of that nature. So we're trying to, to, to eliminate that and make sure that, that officers can get the, the help that they need um, so they can have a he long, healthy, happy career and their families can enjoy them for, for years after they retire. So it, it, it's incredibly important now um, moving forward, um, so we're taking that very seriously. During your interview with the Select Board in November of 2021, you mentioned that this transition was happening at a relatively early point in your law enforcement career. Having assumed this role at this time in your career, have you found it to be beneficial in any ways? Has it presented any challenges? Or have you found it to be more or less irrelevant at this point? Well, like I, I had said uh, a short time ago, I've had a great support staff here. Um, so even though I'm, I'm, it's relatively early in my career, that's just the kind of, typically you don't become a chief till you're much later and closer to retirement, where I have you know, far much longer way to go. So um, even though it's, it is early, you're, see, you're definitely seeing more younger chiefs across, you know, across the country and in, through the state. So um, it, it hasn't really affected me as much as I thought it would. Um, I, I think that given the support that I've had here from, you know, um, in our department, our, our command staff's phenomenal. We really work well as a team. Um, support from the town administration and the, and the select board. I felt like um, I've been given the ability and the, and the trust to do this job. And that's been tremendously helpful to me. So I guess at, at the end of the day, I thought it was going to have a bigger impact on me, um, but it really has had very little relevance, actually. I, I feel that, you know, I'm able to relate well with the officers that are here. Um, you know, I was working with them not very much long ago as opposed to being <laughs> the chief. So um, I can relate to a lot of what they deal with on a day-to-day -day basis. So I feel like that's been beneficial as well. So During that same interview, you discussed the importance of accessibility. What efforts are you making to fulfill your commitment to be an accessible chief of police? That is important because uh, you know, this isn't. This is a, a still a relatively small town, and people should know um, who their police chief is, and and um, and be able to reach out um, if there's an issue. Um, we we feel that you know, and, and I, I this isn't just me, but we we like to have make sure that all of our officers feel like they're accessible to the public. About me in particular, uh, I I try to. You know, obviously as complaints come in or things that might come in um, about certain things, I've actually gone out and met with folks to try to manage issues that may be uh, affecting their quality of life. Um, it, obviously, simple things like returning emails and phone calls uh, as quickly as you can um, and, and letting know, let them know that you understand um, and that their issues are being addressed and they have their voices being heard. Um, you know, I like to try to go over to the senior center next door, you know, when I can and meet with those folks. Though They're great. They've been so supportive of us. Um, but yeah, it, it's, it's always going to be um, important and ongoing and you know it, it and getting out in the community and, and, and meeting people is incredibly important so that you know they know who I am it's I'll be honest with you it doesn't always come natural to me to be able to walk into a room and you know have that personality so I'm working on it but it's, it's something I feel is very important how would you describe the Walpole Police Department's response to what has been characterized as a highly transformative period for law enforcement as a whole it has been um, and I think even though um, some, during, during that period of time when it all first started, I, I think some officers felt like they were kind of on edge about, you know, what was being said about them and how they were being portrayed in the media. But 
how we've handled things here, I mean, we, we, we certainly tightened up our policies, and that was as a direct result of the new post commission that has been established um, by the state. So we've, sta we've tightened up our policies in terms of use of force um, and, and how we report that and, and de-escalation tactics that we um, employ now. And, and even though that, that's required, um, I, I think we were, we were ahead of the curve when it came to that. Um, we understood the need for change um, and we embraced it. Um, we have officers here that are trained in use of force and, and they, they were very proactive in getting ahead of some of the issues that were coming out relative to the George Floyd incident and, um, and strictly just, just with use of force, not anything else. But, um, and, and we got ahead of that and we amended our policies and trained our officers and everybody here bought into and understood what, how, the need for the change and, and, we, and we made those changes um, you know, really ahead of, of, of a lot of the stuff that came down from post. Um, you know, and furthermore, we, we were, you know, aside from just, you know, policy and use of force and things of that nature, you know, we were very um, community oriented prior to a lot of this, but we really made sure we, we, we continued our efforts. And I knew COVID during that time was kind of simultaneous with some of the stuff, so we were, had to scale back a little bit, but we tried to maintain that relationship with the community and continue to, to you know, embrace that community oriented philosophy and get out and meet with folks. And as soon as we were able to start having some of our, our programs again, we got right back into that. So. Um, like I said, it, it, it's been a, it, it's been transformative, but I think that the change you know, is good. And I think I think we, that all of our, us that are um, that are doing this job and, and, and doing this job the right way all embrace it. What does a day in the life of the chief look like? Kelleher describes the typical and not so typical experiences on the job. Um, obviously, we we review um, all the the logs, the reports that, that have come in over, over the previous day, over the weekend. Um, again, we have a command staff here that does a lot of that as well, but I review it anyways just because it's good to know, obviously, to be on top of what's going on. Uh, typically, there'll be um, meetings with other department heads in town uh, with various um, issues that might be going on. There's a lot of construction, a lot of building. Um, the, the 1A project is ongoing, so we'll have meetings with um, you know, town administration, department heads about managing that. Um, I try to get out of the office as much as I can um, and, and get out and about, um, and then, yeah, it, it's managing the, the, the day to day, and, and, and we meet with our, our command staff regularly. We, you know, um, try to develop our our vision going forward and and, and think big picture. So it, it, it's kind of I'm still transitioning into into my role. Uh, in terms of a, a typical day, it seems to be different every day, so it's kind of been nice. But that's kind of the, the gist of what a day to day is like. Uh, your typical police officer does not discharge their, their firearm in the line of duty regularly. Um, very few have, and the ones that have gone through it, it's usually very uh, traumatic and difficult experience. So I would say that anybody that finishes their career and never gets put in that position feels grateful. Um, there are times when we are close, uh, and, and those issues, th those, those things could happen, but uh, we've been very fortunate. I don't think it's ever happened here, to my knowledge, and um, I know I can definitely say that I've never had to do it myself, and I'm, I'm grateful to this point. Um, to not have had to do that. But I would say it's very typical that, that an officer would not have to do that in the line of duty. What do you find most rewarding about serving as chief of police for the Walpole Police Department and the community? Well, it's a very important role, um, and, and I'm, I'm honored to be in it, quite frankly. Um, when Chief Carmichael told me he was leaving <laughs> back in June of last year, I, I, was, uh, I was surprised, but I was happy for him. And, and I, said, I said to myself, this is going to be an opportunity to really uh, to step in and be able to to bring this department forward into the future. Um, like I said before, and I'll say it again, this town's tremendously supportive of us, so to be the leader of this department is, is incredibly rewarding to, to be able to, to continue to listen to them, to um, let them set our agenda and move forward to serve them, but also to serve our officers. You know, the, the officers here rely on me to, to lead them in the right direction. You know, again, we have a tremendous group of officers here that work very hard each day, so to be the leader of this organization is uh, incredibly rewarding. And I'm, beyond uh, honor to be here. Thank you so much for taking the time to speak with us today. You're very welcome, it was my pleasure.